Great. Well, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for attending our today's panel uh, hosted by the Digital Art Fair. We're very grateful to the Digital Art Fair to provide a platform for us to continue talking about uh, transformation of the art world. My name is Jahan Chu. Uh, I'm the founder of Kinetic. Uh, I'm a former art dealer, former uh, Sotheby's employee. Uh, now I run a, a blockchain and crypto fund, and I invest uh, in blockchain startups, but I also uh, am a longtime collector of art since 2006, uh, and I've been collecting NFTs uh, for the past number of years as well. Um, I'm very, very happy to be joined by a, a, an extremely illustrious and uh, knowledgeable panel, uh, starting with Ava Yeager from Serpentine Galleries, um, who is uh, the curator um, of technology. Uh, Creative Arts Technologies uh, at Serpentine, uh, which obviously is one of the most, you know, kind of lauded uh, and influential and, and interesting and pioneering uh, not-for-profit institutions uh, in, in all of Europe. Uh, we're also joined by Steve Sachs, who is a very old friend of mine. Um, I used to kind of buy art from him back in the, the early days of uh, kind of Asian contemporary art from Bitforms Gallery, really one of the pioneers uh, of multimedia digital art. Uh, and then, of course, my good friend, uh, Mike Winkleman, aka Beeple, who has you know, really led the charge uh, and brought NFTs to the fore uh, many times and continues to kind of reinvent himself uh, and, and um, you know, stay true to his own practice. So um, I'll let them introduce themselves, but just to set a quick frame around what we're going to be talking about today, it's going to be a very casual conversation. Um, and really what we wanted to discuss is, again, this whole idea of transformation of the art world. Um, what does that actually mean? Uh, are we talking about medium? Are we talking about content? Are we talking about market? What kind of dynamics um, from you know, the economics uh, to how we consider art? Who gets to be counted as art? Uh, and how much or how little does the medium of technology and especially NFTs impact that? So we're going to be kind of going around and, and you know, I'm sure we're going to meander, but really appreciate everybody. So maybe I'll just start off um, just by allowing everybody to give, again, a little bit of a, a you know, 30 seconds on themselves. Uh, Ava, let's start with you. The lights just went off in the room that I'm in. So I'm trying to get the motion sensor to go off. <laughs> we can see you um, fine though. Yeah. Um, just a quick. Yeah, so I work at Serpentine where we really are thinking about how we can bring artists into a conversation about building new infrastructure <laughs> for cultural institutions to advance into the 21st century. Um, a lot of the ways that art institutions operate now is a very 20th century model. And I think we um, are in a unique position to take certain capabilities from the public sector and the art sector and look towards the future of decentralized technology. Um, yeah. And if you don't mind, I mean, I'm sure like a lot of our audience uh, may not be familiar with the contemporary art context um, outside, maybe they're coming into it just from NFTs and crypto. C can you just help contextualize what Serpentine is in, in the kind of pantheon or the context of, of contemporary art world? Yeah, sure. So obviously you've all heard of art galleries and those are typically commercial entities, but um, the state has also created a certain amount of institutions that take care of kind of the canon of our history in some cases. Um, they try to raise, you know, marginalized voices in some cases or rewrite histories. And um, in the case of the institution that I work for, uh, we don't have a collection. And in fact, we just commission artwork. So we don't even really um, show kind of existing artworks, but we make them from the ground. And that's kind of a unique capability within our team that curators act as kind of technical producers and project managers, and we're all part of the creative process, um, bringing works to life. Um, we've recently been talking about our practices that engage with crypto as a medium or Web3 as a medium um, in the form of kind of the full stack artist, when artists engage with them in this way. Um, one artist that we've been talking to recently uh, Harm van den Dorpel uh, talks about that the difference between kind of artists and content producers is that artists have a role to play in the actual infrastructure and the interfaces yeah. and in the media that show the work. 
And so I would say that we're in the unique position of not just providing content, but actually working on the infrastructure that presents the work itself. Awesome. And again, even though uh, the name of the, of the institution is Serpentine Galleries, you don't actually sell anything. That's a kind of an, an important um, kind of- Yeah, we're note. a kunst Not a yeah. commercial gallery in that sense. Cool. Um, Mike, no, please. No. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Um, 30 seconds on me. <laughs> 35, whatever. Uh, I am a digital artist. Um, I mean, you already said all the stuff. I've made artwork for the last 20 years, a bunch of short films and <clears throat> digital weird stuff and every days. And now we've got a uh, studio here that we're building out, um, which I think will be interesting sort of to to Ava's point about the sort of programming and being involved in the infrastructure. I very much agree that that's <clears throat> something that um, I think is really important. And I think um, I'm excited to sort of, you know, have this be a piece of that puzzle for sort of like digital artists being able to show work at the space. Perfect, thanks. Steve. Hi there. So I'm the founder of Bitforms Gallery. And we started the gallery around 20 years ago with a very specific focus on media art. And obviously, this is way before all this crazy hype happened, way before NFTs. And I think the goal of the gallery really is to educate and define um, the history of this kind of work. A lot of people don't understand um, artists have been dealing with experimental media and new media and multimedia for a very long time, even before my gallery existed. So the main goal really is to, um, again, educate, uh, really define the history and to show diversity amongst um, the type of work uh, being shown under this uh, medium. Awesome, thanks. So let's get started. Uh, I wanna do a flash round. So these are like one word answers, yes or no, or you know, better or worse, okay? Uh, and then we'll kind of get into it. So first, you know, to the to the title of the of the panel, uh, transformation of the art world. Like, is the art world transforming as a result of NFTs? Yes or no? Uh, Ava. No. No. Steve. Yes. Mike. Yes. Okay. Follow up question. Um, for those of you that said, actually, all of you can answer this. Is it for Better or worse, this transformation? Oof. Tough one. <laughs> the only two answers. Uh, oh, man. The whole what point of art to... is nuance, you know? And then you ask us to answer it. Yeah. That's <laughs> true. Mutiny. Mutiny of the team. No two answers. No two answers. Better or worse? We're not going to hold you to it. It's, it's, a, it's your, your gut. Ooh, ooh. I would say better. I'm going to say better. Ava? Ugh. You don't need to transform it anyway, but <clears throat> influence of NFTs. I'll just <laughs> stick with my current line of worse, no and worse. Fine. Mike, <laughs> thank you for being <laughs> candid. Mike. <laughs> There's going to be certainly a lot of downsides, but I think overall we net better. Great. In five years, will I we still. Say it just one word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, in five years, will we still be talking about NFTs as distinct from art? Yes. Steve says yes. Mike, yeah. what do you say? Ava says yes. Mm -hmm. No. I say no. Last one. How many years will it be until there's a full solo show for, let's just, for lack of a better term, an NFT or crypto artist in a major top tier institution? Your answer is the number of years. Of how far that is off? How many years, how many years off? I'm talking about full show. I'm not talking about like a single, uh, you know. Like within a year. Within a year. Yeah. Okay. Ava? Yeah, long. yeah I was going to say. Top tier blue chip, blue chip institution. <laughs> 
I, I mean, Rafik has a, show, a major piece opening at MoMA in two weeks. Yeah. So that's kind of starting. I'm talking to about like retrospective style. All right. So you guys think it's good. <laughs> retrospective. Than... Anyway, fine. Um, okay, cool. All right. Well, thanks for that. I just want to kind of take a poll and get people's, you know, kind of um, temperature on all this. So I guess let's start off just talking about um, what, the, what art worlds exist. I mean, from, from my training, you know, I come from more of a classical contemporary art, you know, kind of world training. I look at the art world um, in a very, you know, institutional standpoint where, you know, you have galleries, which are the commercial side, you have auction houses, which are secondary market, you have major museums and you have not-for-profit spaces, which, and you have the artists, you have schools, you have, you know, media, like, and that's the art world to me. But it feels like with the advent of NFTs, a whole different community, a whole different vibe, a whole different infrastructure, uh, a whole different market and economy has come. Um, do you guys, what, what do you guys think about this? Um, are, do, you, do you think that there are two art worlds? Um, do you think that, you know, what do you think of the kind of current dynamic? What's your impression of where we are in terms of the NFT art world and the traditional art world? Um, Ava, maybe I'll start with you. Um, I think we're kind of like past the time of being able to talk about an art world um, as such. I think there have always been these different forces. I think there's a kind of overemphasis just because of the market dynamics of NFTs that um, brings them into the media. But just in terms of like a kind of history of the way people have engaged, even in blockchain art, that's been around for a long time, as Steve was saying, um, and throughout the history of art, there have always been um, people who were ignored, groups who were ignored. So I, I don't think it, any there's any big difference. I guess that goes back to to your point about there's no major transformation happening. This is is it fair to say that you think this is you know kind of the latest uh, vein of you know kind of discovery within the larger context of of, of art generally. Yeah, I, I just I don't see a fundamental transformation. Everything that I'm seeing that that's happening with NFTs follows very conservative kind of transactional. Um, systems of creating value. Steve, you've been uh, in this world for for a while. Um, what what do you think? Are there two art worlds? Uh, you're on mute, by the way. Oh, there's absolutely two art worlds, um, and and it's changing. I mean, when it first started, it was probably the most disruptive thing that happened to my business since since we opened in 20 years. Um, for a few reasons, one we were already in this field selling this type of work and defining this type of work, uh, explaining how to collect it, preserve it, present it. But, you know, my the audience that I was working with was quite small, really, relative to the, the larger art world in general, uh, dealing with media art. But when this happened, um, somewhat thanks to Mr. Beeple over there, um, basically, a, a massive population recognized digital as an art form. And that had both positive and negative impact. The positive is many, many, many millions of people now were interested, asking questions, buying. The negative, of course, there was a lack of curation, filtering. Um, there was an overwhelming um, desire to make, you know, for financial gain, which of course, is around in the traditional art world, but I think it it went to a very, very different level um, with the introduction of NFTs. Got it, Mike. How about you? I mean, is it fair to say that you you your kind of training and your experience, you know, prior to the NFT boom, was not in the traditional you know art world, and and now you very much are in that context. How do you think about these these two worlds, or do you even think that there are two worlds? And how do you think about you know kind of entering both of them? Yeah, I definitely think there are two worlds. And I think what's interesting to me about that is that it was two worlds that were like kind of like laying out in the open because everybody has seen a bunch of digital art. Everybody has seen movies. Everybody has seen video games. Everybody has seen websites and like all this stuff. Like it was like <laughs> kind of like weird that none of that sort of like craft and practice was part of the like traditional art world but it just wasn't and like nobody was thinking about it like that myself included until 
the but, but actually, sorry, just to interrupt, but what are some examples of that? Because in, in, in a way, it's everywhere, but to your point that the traditional art world didn't either recognize it or doesn't, or even still doesn't actually see it as contemporary art. Like, what what is it that they, they were missing? Is it the commercial I, side? Because I can see how... I think it's more so that these are the, like, sort of, like, tools and the visual language that is, like, predominant in society, yet it was just not part of digital art in that same sort of, like, sense. Um, and I think you there was a bunch of sort of like people who were looked at myself included looked at purely as like crafts people and then all of a sudden it was like wait a second these are actually like artists and sort of a, a reframing of kind of like the whole thing and so um you know I, I think it's really just another medium though and it will be seen as just another medium and, and it, I, I like in this moment very much the photography and this existed mm -hmm. for a very long time and like then it was reclassified and the people who were doing it considered themselves artists but like the out the the traditional world did not um so i think it's really that collecting piece was the and collecting and and, and i think again you know steve obviously has had a gallery where it was it was, you know, selling digital art for a very long time. But I think having that natively digital collecting piece and, and it just kind of like clicking in everybody's head that it's like, here's kind of more of like a pure way of, of sort of like owning this stuff. I think um, that is, is what kind of resonated with a lot of people and, and sort of, you know, why you saw this like boom. But I, again, I think in the future, we'll be just talking about it as another medium you know it's just you you like it you don't it's got good and bad it's not you know it's just another like part of art cool cool i mean i think that leads me to a little bit around um the the kind of practice of curation because you talked about you know um it was you know it was it was always there but it wasn't seen as as art necessarily um typically you know for things to be quote unquote seen as art it requires a, a, a context and it requires both institutions and it feels like your community and generation of digital artists and, and the reason why maybe people thought you were more like craftspersons was because it lacked that. I mean, do you have curators uh, and Ava and, and Steve, I mean, again, you guys should all chime in. Are there curators for this quote unquote other type of digital art? I mean, Steve, you're, you're, you've always kind of crossed over both, but mm -hmm. who are the, um, or who were and who will be uh, the kind of curators who are kind of bringing this other type of work in? Or is it is it just all the same? I, I I think there's definitely different skill sets and different knowledge for that type of curator. Uh, there are definitely not as many focused on this type of work. I, I wish there were more, not just curators, writers, uh, critics. There needs to be more critical uh, dialogue around this kind of work. And I think that's where the art uh, essence comes in. It becomes this uh connection to cultural change that you know is super important right now and it does need this higher intellectual definition of of what's happening ava is there a difference between i mean to mike's point about craftsperson is there how, how do you kind of like separate or distinguish somebody who very much is like a digital craftsperson and someone who's more of a digital artist how should somebody on the street who's just coming into this medium tell the difference? Um, I mean, it's kind of like an age old question of, you know, who's the artist? Um, it used to be a question around, you know, is the fabricator the artist um, or is the developer the artist and so on. I don't know if I really have any authority to weigh in on that, except just to say that when we build projects, it's very important to me that everyone feel a creative input because I, I think within each medium, uh, whether it's the graphic design layer, the invigilation layer, um, the theoretical or conceptual research and development, these are each important points. Um, I think I uh, I didn't quite answer your question, but I don't want to make a judgment call. I don't want to make a judgment yeah. call, but that's like a kind of- How blanket. dare you? How dare you make a judgment call? No, I, I appreciate that. I, I, think, I think it's just helpful for people to, 
to have guideposts, like people who don't think about art necessarily every day, to have guideposts about to try and understand some of these some of these uh, dis uh, distinctions. Um, I want to talk about audiences uh, a bit, and you know, the different audiences uh, of these type of uh, you know kind of art. And I guess you know, in the when I think about the traditional art world, um, the audience, you know, they're either like a museum goer, you're an art aficionado, like you just like art, you like to see art, you go to the gallery, you go to the museum, but you're not actively collecting because, you know, maybe it's not interesting or maybe it's too expensive um, to, to kind of participate in. Um, but it seems like in the NFT generation, um, collecting is very much a part of, you know, it's integral to appreciating and participating. I know very few people that are interested in NFTs that don't also collect. Is this, um, is this good for the art world? Is this kind of helping to introduce the practice of collecting? How do we kind of harness that? I mean, Steve, I mean, you deal with people mm -hmm. who are buying art, collecting art all the time. What, what do you think about this, you know, evolution or is it an evolution of, of how audiences think about participation in art beyond just looking? Oh, absolutely. I think um, the biggest change has been, uh, I think, community building and connection uh, from collector to artist. Um, I've never seen uh, that depth um, before in since I've opened the gallery. Um, there's just an open line of communication and that is very different. You know, I, I would say one of the biggest thing that things that's changed in in my world was that, you know, prior to this NFT becoming um, hugely successful and popular, um, you know, a collector that owned a file would actually protect it and not want to show it uh, in, in a public way where, in this case, NFT is the more popular, the more people that see it, the more value uh, actually that that's, uh, is increasing. And but that was why, why do you want to protect flip. it? How do you account for that difference? Why, why did they want to protect it? Well, previously, it's just like, you know, in the traditional art world, you would, if, if I sold a digital file, people would say, you know, who's going to, is someone going to steal this? What's going to happen? Like, how do I protect my, my artwork, my asset? And it basically went the opposite direction after, after NFTs became popular and popularity became what was creating value. Um, which has a direct relationship to social media and the artists basically a willingness to do that. Um, so yeah, these were very big, big uh, drastic changes that, that I noticed. And so where do we go from, where do we go from here in terms of, you know, kind of audience consumption of, of, you know, art as a medium. I mean, from my personal standpoint, like I'm super impressed by how many people are collecting uh, even if it's, you know, a, a $20 NFT they, it really feels like they're into this idea of acquiring and collecting and, and, you know, to a degree curating their own, you know, kind of personality and their own interest. Um, Ava, do you see that, you know, as being a dynamic that's kind of important in terms of kind of the art audience and the art consumption and how people relate to art? Definitely. I think there's a call for kind of changing of the guard. And I think one one of the things that I find really interesting in terms of your previous question about curation is that groups of artists or collectives are deciding to curate amongst themselves and having those sort of like more microcosm conversations. Um, I think for us, the way that we've decided to sort of position this transformation is to think about a transition from the kind of white cube model of the gallery space uh, to what we call kind of the user experience of art. And this isn't specifically related to NFTs per se, but it does signal a kind of change that instead of an audience or a public, we have to consider them as a user, as like an active participant in um, the creation process. But I think what it also allows is for the artwork to not only be this kind of like front end final static thing, but for it to be a process. Um, and so maybe there's something about like decentralized technologies that kind of re-enlivens the um, sort of like systems aesthetic uh, argument 
from the 70s, you know, that we move from a kind of object oriented society to a systems oriented society. And I think that's going to happen. I think right now people are very fascinated by the kind of front end object of the NFT. But artists who have been working in this space for a long time are much more interested in the systems and the like different delivery pipelines or secondary market trading or I don't know there's so much it's like a very new nascent space um, with a lot of developments and art is just like one that final artwork is just one thing moving it forward well that I think that's super fascinating and it kind of like teased me up perfectly to kind of come back to Mike maybe to just talk about his thoughts on this idea of art artworks and objects as systems uh, and kind of the you know ongoing uh, artworks like human one so you know, for, for those of you who, who haven't heard of this, Human One was um, is a physical object that also has an NFT. Um, it was sold uh, at Christie's um, earlier this year uh, for about $29 million and collected by uh, a great collector named uh, from the crypto world named Ryan Zurer. Um, and, you know, part of the idea of the artwork, which I, I think was, was quite super interesting and brilliant, um, is that the artwork itself continues to be updated by Mike, um, you know, over time, and I guess until Mike decides to stop updating it. And so it becomes this kind of really interesting, not only uh, dialogue as, as he's often commenting on, on kind of society, but also like this channel um, to the collector uh, because that, that channel is like a direct relationship where he can continue communicating. So Mike, I mean, what do you think about what you know, Ava was saying around you know, artworks as systems and kind of how decentralization is kind of maybe changing the format of, of you know, audience relationships and collector relations to art. Yeah, I very much agree with her that I think that this technology has sort of allowed a new sort of dynamics um, and new sort of like ways of expressing things around the way these things are sold, the way that they are sort of like traded after the sort of like rules that go along with that. Or if you have this thing in your wallet, then it will change to this. Or if you sell it within this certain time period or after this certain time period, it's going to, the metadata and the NFT is going to change to X, Y, Z. Um, and I think we've only barely sort of like begun scratching the surface with that. With human one, it's kind of like the most sort of like basic kind of like version of a system and that I can just change the, the, the sort of like artwork whenever I want. Um, and I think that there's, you know, within that, there's a lot of different things that you could do in terms of, you know, playing with time and playing with different sort of like context. And so I think this idea of artwork being much more dynamic as a sort of like broader sort of like, you know, sort of like generalization with this new medium, I think is something that people are going to understand a lot more in a way that was just not possible in the past when all of the sort of like meaning and context in an artwork was the physical object it's just it's a static object and it's like how can it change but these things can change and, and sort of like update and, and sort of have all manner of different sort of like new meaning which i think you're going to see a lot more people like exploring in the future but one of the things I wanted to bring up also about that work was the emphasis on physical, uh, Jehan, because for me, that was the other thing that was a problem uh, early on was a lack of um, uh, thought about how that work would be presented, how, how that work would be experienced in your life as, as an artwork that, that impacts you emotionally, again, intellectually, conceptually. That has improved quite a bit since all of this started. Um, and, you know, my gallery is really um, very much behind the artist, uh, you know, in terms of the physical presentation and experience. And we work really hard at that. Um, and I think most artists prior to the NFT marketplace, um, that was a big part of their art practice. How does the work get experienced? And that was also speaking of disruptive, that was one of the bigger things that that happened uh, or that I saw uh, in this um, evolution. Yeah, Ava, I'd also love to get your kind of thoughts on this idea of kind of like, you know, presentation uh, for digital art. Uh, obviously it's, it's something which I'm sure you guys have to wrestle with. 
Um, how do you think about exhibition making, you know, in a in a time and place where, you know, the the artwork can be in multiple places at the same time and, and like the actual, like a, the, the NFT is really an access point in a way, not just the actual object. Um, how do you think about like objects and, and uh, kind of physical versus digital with, with NFTs and presentation? Yeah, so I, I think what Steve was saying is really key that, you know, the experiences that you have IRL um, are really different from the way that you necessarily get information online. So like the senses that you can evoke when you're working on something that has physical space. Also bringing people together in person and in the same space. So we're working on a couple different projects now where we really have to ask ourselves the question, why would someone come to the gallery experience this and what can we offer them? And I think sometimes it's a very, um, non-obvious expression of the artwork. So maybe it is true that you can experience, for instance, a game much better in the comfort of your own home, but that there's an ethos of the kind of community that that game was built under that you could create at the gallery itself. So I guess I just see it as less of a one-to-one -one relationship that I'm looking at the practice of the whole artist um, and the kind of ethos of the project itself and trying to use the space specifically for uh, whatever that space and the groups of people that I can bring into that space can provide to the project as a whole, not just to show the work. Got it. Got it. No, that's 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 really interesting. Um, let's kind of shift gears a little bit to uh, maybe kind of a uh, traipsing over to the to the market side of things. I, I do think that the economy that this has enabled um, has been uh, pretty 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 much a central part of the narrative and the, and the kind of the journey of uh, of nfts and this um so we had like a bull market uh we have now a bear market um i think that overall volumes of kind of nft purchasing and, and trading are, are way down um is this a good thing is this is a bad thing um where do you guys kind of see how, how do you see the market um evolving and not just you know price up price down or volume up volume down but the relationship of the market to the actual work and the practice i mean i think it's fair to say that in a good way all of this kind of expensive nft um market brought in a lot of new people mm -hmm. um both collectors and also brought a lot of attention um and it brought in a lot of you know creators not all of them good but not all of them bad either um <laughs> Where do you think this kind of goes um, and, and how do you think that that market kind of evolves in relation to the, the quality of the work? Um, Steve, you're you know firmly in the market, so let's let's mm -hmm. let's start. Yeah, I think um, this this um, down market is is a very positive thing for art creation. I think what happened was extraordinary. It, it was very fast. Uh, it was high impact. Uh, it was volume. Um, but, you know, Part of my job as, as a gallerist is to make sure the artist has time to create work and to not rush because the market is demanding something. And that's when the creative output can, can get diminished. And I definitely started to see that big time. People were just cranking out work because they saw a market with, uh, with very little thought about what was actually being released. So. Again, it's, you know, artists, you know, like in many businesses, you want to capitalize on things. But in terms of the, the concept of art, it definitely is going to benefit from this slowdown. Mike, I mean, probably more than anybody here, you, you are like single handedly responsible for a lot of like the, the kind of market dynamics, um, at least in the beginning. And, you know, kind of obviously everything followed you. Um, what what do you think about the the kind of current market and, and how do you think about your own practice in terms of um you know both creative creatively but then also you know um even as a somebody who has to maintain like a pretty large studio and you know yeah i think it's something where um this is going to separate out a lot of people because 
digital artists have another option. They're, like there's a level where they'll just stop doing it because it's sort of like, okay, mm -hmm. I can like, make more money just going and booking another week working on the adventures movie or whatever. I'm just going to go do that. So it's sort of like, it will kind of like level out and, and sort of like the people who were again, just in it for the money will, you know, sort of move on. And I think it, it's one of those things where it's definitely good in the long run because I think it, having time and having um, a career, I think those are in, an important thing for holding value in, in artwork versus just like some flash in the pan thing that, you know, somebody was here for three months or whatever and now they're gone and they're done you know, that's not going to sort of, that's not going to be good for the overall sort of like long-term value, like health of the space too. So I think you're going to see um, just sort of like a narrowing of voices in the space, which is probably a good thing because I think for a second there, there's a lot of voices where it's like, I'm not here. <laughs> sure you are exactly here for the long-term and sort of like wanting to have a healthy ecosystem of artists and curators and, and you know, this whole thing. Um, taking a slightly different tack here, uh, maybe slightly away from the market. I'm curious about like this, because you're talking about like, you know, the different roles inside of the art world. I'm, I'm curious about like how, you know, Ava, we see the, the infrastructure um, of, you know, the kind of digital art uh, kind of world evolving. I mean, obviously like, major institutions like yourself are, are kind of have, have been and are increasingly, you know, focusing on digital art. Like, do you see more infrastructure coming into play? I mean, are we going to see a museum which is focused on, you know, digital art? Are we going to see, we are, there are already a lot of curators, uh, but probably per capita, not that many who are knowledgeable, I would say, about digital art uh, compared to more traditional formats. I mean, how do you see the overall, you know, traditional art world, like adapting from, platforms, uh, skill sets, uh, and overall exposure to, you know, digital? Yeah, it's something that we're thinking a lot about. We write a strategic briefing every year called Future Art Ecosystems, which is kind of by the sector for the sector. Um, and it's specifically uh, targeted towards the advancement of what we are calling 21st century cultural infrastructure. And I, and by that, what I mean is like the systems that are required to produce, distribute and financialize um, uh, art and advanced technology and specifically towards a social agenda. I think it's, it's really different than the conversation that's happening around the art market. And I think these things often get confused because legacy institutions play a huge role in validating or invalidating certain market dynamics um, when it comes to contemporary or yeah, any kind of art. Um, and when we think about our like Web3 strategy or our decentralized technology strategy, um, we really try and take a long view. So instead of trying to run to drop an NFT, um, we're trying to understand like what is our core mission as an institution? Who are the partners that we need to realize that core mission? And what can we learn from the sector right now? So we have been asked many times to work on NFT projects, but for us, what we stand to gain, I think from this, the web crypto web three space is actually the kind of nascent logics that lie within them around like how to decentralize power, how to share resources, how to build interoperable infrastructure. And it's those logic systems that we're looking to reproduce, not the actual works itself. So thinking about how art and tech organizations can maybe uh, work together and like contribute to shared resources um, in order to support artists being able to, for instance, do more research and development before they enter the market space and how that research and development might contribute back to um, the public's interest. Uh, right now we're in a time where a lot of decisions around technology are made primarily by you know, corporations. And obviously the public sector 
could be this really valuable space and art and the kind of capabilities of the art world that like also Steve describes criticality and this ability to create discourse and ability to like house conversations around the aesthetics of the technology itself are super important capabilities that we don't want to lose to those market dynamics. No, that, that's super interesting. And I, I like this idea that, you know, you guys are not only focusing on um, the kind of artworks, but also the the, the, the systems underneath that, that the kind of concepts like blockchain decentralization kind of uh, enable for institutions. Um, are you guys looking at DAOs? Are, are you going to start? Is there going to be like a serpentine DAO? I mean, are, are you guys already doing something in that space? I mean, seems very, you know, natural the way that you speak. Yeah, so since 2018, we've run a blockchain lab um, headed by Ruth Catlow from Furtherfield. And she's been working on centralized autonomous organizations with artists since I think 2015 or 16. Um, so DAO thinking and organizing around DAOs has been uh, really important to us. But in terms of like the rubber hitting the road, it just has a lot to do with um, you know, regulation, how will that, if Serpentine became a DAO, how would it be recognized? Who would it pay taxes to? Like, you know, all of this kind of legal questions, um, which are super fun and to like speculate about. Um, and we do that within the legal lab, but um, at the moment, you know, there's really nothing that a more informal group of people who agree to a set of terms that's maybe DAO-like or based on DAO thinking can't achieve. Mike, have you ever thought about um, that these kind of concepts of, of more distributed uh, kind of support and funding for, for your projects? I mean, would you ever consider doing like a, a major work or a major installation or a major exhibition um, that, you know, kind of incorporated some of these, you know, decentralized support mechanisms like DAOs or, or other? I mean, obviously, you have a you have a very wide and you know large audience um, who are pretty pretty actively uh, you know uh, supportive. Yeah, I it's definitely something I've thought about. Um, it's one of those things where I very much agree that there's no reason to like rush into this stuff because again, there's no once you kind of do this stuff again, it's not just like okay, well, we'll just sort of like shut that down. I mean, people have these tokens and you kind of have to continue to support these projects. So it's definitely not something that I want to rush into, but it's definitely something that I find very interesting. And I think there's so many different ways to have different interesting, like artistic dynamics of how you could sort of like interact with a DAO, how I could interact with a DAO as a single artist looking to sort of like interact with this you know other sort of like autonomous entity that I think there there's certainly uh, I think a lot of, of room for experimentation there um, but again it's something that I want to make sure is fully fully sort of like thought out here because uh, again it's I, I would hate to do something and and I think that's where it's it's sort of nice right now to see all the experimentation that people are doing with DAOs and like oh okay that seems to be working or like okay that really doesn't like feel like it's doing anything so I think to me right now I'm very much sort of like learning and sort of kind of like gathering ideas to make sure uh you know when and if I do something it's really sort of like thought out and, and planned out. Steve, where, where do you fall uh, in the kind of DAO possibility? Yeah, we haven't really been doing so much in that area. Um, for me, what's been interesting is how these collectives and um, larger projects can offer uh, char charitable donations. I think that's something that I know you were involved with um, and the the level of people thinking about charity within the art world has changed pretty dramatically. Um, and I, I, it's been amazing to see that, you know, an artist does a project, they know they're gonna get X amount of money and X amount is going to charity. The fact that that's a dialogue is incredible um, and is hopefully leading to, to good things. But that to me was really something special um, that I saw develop. Cool. Um, getting back to the market side, and there was a question that was around royalties. Um, obviously, recently, uh, a number of platforms have kind of come out and said that they will not enforce royalties, um, which I thought was pretty, pretty shocking and pretty, pretty poor, um, eh, poor form. 
Uh, but I'm curious, and you know, I think when NFTs, you know, first emerged onto the scene as as kind of content and, and format, one of the great, you know, reasons it was touted was because it could provide ongoing support and ongoing, you know, residual revenue the way that, you know, Dua de Suite or Artist Resale Right uh, does in the traditional art world, although it's pretty poorly enforced, I think, in, in the physical world. And here's a way for digital art to automatically benefit the artist and benefit uh, even the galleries. Um, with this being questioned as a, as a standard um, and even the standard being reversed, what do you guys think about this? I mean, is it just hands down, it sucks? Or is there... <laughs> Can you kind of understand perhaps, you know, some of the arguments for, for why platforms are choosing not to enforce this? Um, you know, people, I think you're the probably the one who would be most affected by, by this. Would you sell on a platform that doesn't enforce royalty? Why or why not? Um, well, it's one of those things where I think you can put in some level of code to sort of like block out platforms. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm obviously pro royalties. But I think we do need to understand the kind of like um, technical limitations of enforcing those royalties, which are very real. And there's really no way. I mean, again, there's really no way to enforce these royalties. So I think you are going to kind of continue, unfortunately, to see this race to the bottom. I think the real sort of one will be is if OpenSea uh, decides to go optional royalties. But I do think, and I sort of like posed this, and I think it would make a lot more sense. Right now, the royalties are being put on the seller. And I think if the royalties were instead a buyer's premium, you would have a lot more people willing to sell this because you have somebody now incentivized to pay this as they're entering the project versus exiting the project. So I, I think we should definitely consider switching to that. Um, because I think it is a much more viable route. Uh, but I think it's one of those things, again, there's ways around this. I'm obviously pro royalties and that's kind of where we're at. Like, you know, I hate to say it, that that's, people are gonna choose to do it. And I think you need to, in this current model, you need to be able to sort of like not fuck over your collectors and have them want to pay that. That's really all it comes down to. I agree with that. Please, please don't fuck us over. Um, Steve, <laughs> what, what um, about kind of this whole royalty thing? I mean, obviously as a gallery, you're also affected. Well, what's interesting is the get, I mean, any of the artists that are doing these projects, we're, we're not really getting involved with the royalty aspect. We're letting the artists keep all of those. Um, we think, you know, that should be separate from our, our system. Um, I think the bigger problem is, you know, the hype around it was so great. Every artist assumes that's going to happen. They assume that the royalties will kick in. And, you know, the reality is it's not going to happen all the time, or there's a problem, or it's not the right platform, uh, or someone does something they weren't supposed to do. So, I think that was the problem on our end is that there were these expectations and that was really um, something a lot of the artists were excited about. So as people were saying, it's, it's you know, we'll see, it's not quite there yet, but if it happens, we're definitely a supporter of it. I also think another thing I would like to say about this royalty thing is, I really think this is actually kind of a, a moot point because I don't, I think when people hear royalties, they think music royalties, where you just keep getting this residual money. I don't think that's going to be the case. <laughs> I think yeah. people are going to buy these things and then they're going to hold them and there's going to be very little royalties to have, period. And and, and I, I think really it, it's not going to be this like, I, I don't know anybody now who's making a significant amount of money off of royalties. And like, I just don't see it being something where people are continuing to make like, significant sums of money in the future. Mm -hmm. I think there's something um, that we've been floating super, super speculatively around like a kind of value creation that hap that I spoke about a little bit with particularly like gatekeeping organizations, like a place like Serpentine, where if you were able to like make that initial investment without needing a lot of sponsorship, mm -hmm. you could take more risk on maybe a younger artist and write the institution into the contract 
and get kickbacks in the secondary market. And so that would present, I mean, it's interesting speculatively just to think about it because it presents like a whole different kind of uh, funding model where instead of like fundraising from philanthropy or whatever, you like take risk on artists who you think is really great and you, and like your success depends on their success eventually. Mm -hmm. And you already know because you're this kind of like gatekeeping organization that you're going to inject value into them by presenting them as part of your program. I've always thought that... I've always thought that actually it, it kind of in many ways boils down to the artist because the artist controls the, the smart contract. And that is the, I think, the, the kind of um, binary truth um, of what gets enforced. And I always thought that if there was, it would be cool to have a way where buyers would have to, or sellers would have to prove that the royalty was paid, whether it's on chain or not. Um, mm. And in order for that to, you know, once it was proved, then the artist would basically validate that the transfer was valid. And if the transfer is unvalid because the, the royalty is unpaid, then it would basically become like a dead artwork in the sense that it's no longer validated by the artist and in, in a sense disowned until the, the royalty is paid. And of course, that would then kind of have a knock-on effect where the you know, maybe the owner still has the file, has the, the actual NFT, but perhaps um, that type of standard if you wanted to resell it, if you wanted to display or exhibit it in an institution, they wouldn't accept it unless it has that kind of artist's, you know, kind of validation. I, I think that's one of the the kind of unlocks that that artists, you know, still have. And I, I actually do believe that royalty enforcement needs to sit with the artist, and then therefore it could be outsourced to companies like Artist Resale, Art, um, Artist Rights Society, who, whose job it is to kind of, you know, protect that. So I always thought that was pretty interesting. Um, a follow, there's a follow-up question uh, around CC0 or Creative Commons 0, um, you know, which is this, you know, kind of idea in, you know, roughly in NFTs and, and kind of intellectual property where, you know, artists give up uh, or creators give up all rights and waive all rights to their IP. And so, you know, one basic example would be like, you know, Born Apes or, or kind of, you know, Moonbirds. What, what do you guys think of, of this? Um, do you think that this is relevant for contemporary art is it more something that's for like pfps and kind of less fine art type of content um you know control over over these images i mean you know as we've been talking about with artist uh right society has been the standard since forever is there some type of new paradigm is there some advantage or benefit for artists to give up um the intellectual property start with you mike because it's probably most relevant for you yeah, so I've been giving out work under Creative Commons since like 2010, a bunch of sort of like abstract um, little short videos, BJ clips, and then I gave away the project files with them and the same with my short films gave away the like project files. So I think that ethos of sort of like just giving things away to me is more sort of on the digital side with like open source and like that's how I sort of like came to it and people like Joshua Davis who you know 20 years ago was giving away his his sort of like files through PlayStation that that made like a big sort of impact on me too but I think um it's very much an experiment and I think uh it's sort of there there's a lot of different models being tested the the board apes are actually different than the like moonbirds and that they're having you know you license that ip and so you have the rights to to that sort of like image um but even that's going to be tested in courts here real quick it's just a lot of this stuff is very experimental and i think um it's again something that i would not rush to because once you put something in the public domain that's that's that so I think um, it, it, it is an interesting, there are a lot of interesting arguments being had uh, about it. And I don't think, to me, I'm honest, it really seems like a artistic preference and something where it's like, you know, that's part of the artwork and that's part of the like, what you're trying to do with this and what you're trying to say, then, you know, this is obviously a very interesting thing. And now we have these tools to distribute this work. It's not just that you can put it in the public domain. It's that you can put it in the public domain and like it can get distributed very sort of like quickly. Um, right. So I think it's it's very interesting. And like, I think people do need to understand a lot of this stuff though, legally wise is we're on some pretty shaky ground here that we don't really know actually a lot of the legal 
and where the rubber is going to hit the road with a lot of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Ava, what do you think? CC zero. Um, I've actually heard of like of artists selling NFTs and then licensing those NFTs under CC zero. And I think that's super interesting because it gets to the kind of provenance point. So it's like whatever happens so that afterwards they can do whatever they want, but they can say that they hey, can you actually it. explain so that a little like more? I didn't quite catch it. Can, can you just explain what that what that mechanism is again, that approach? I mean, I haven't really looked into this, but I've heard a specific specific artist was telling me that they were selling NFTs. <laughs> But then making making it part of the contract that that NFT had a CC zero license, so people can do the owner of that token can do whatever they want with it, and they can freely distribute it. So for me, then it's an interesting dynamic where the token holder has basically just bought this like provenance right, um, and that's what's valuable about it, not the work itself. It, it kind of, um, so for some reason, it makes me think of uh, 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 Tina Segal in a way. Mm. I don't know why, mm. but interesting. That's that's uh, that is interesting. I, but again, I maybe to, to to Mike's point, that also kind of goes back to the statement that the artist wants to make. Um, we're coming up to the end of the hour, um, and it's been a, a really kind of packed conversation. So I really appreciate it. Uh, maybe we can end on just final thoughts. Uh, about, you know, again, this transformation of, of the art world. I mean, what are you, let's end on like an optimistic note. <laughs> what are you guys um, seeing that's cool, interesting, you know, projects, artists, platforms, uh, or what do you hope to see kind of next? Um, Steve, let's start with you. Sure. Well, uh, it's it's funny. We just uh, opened a show, uh, gosh, a couple of days ago, um, revolving around DALI. Um, which is an incredibly uh, popular uh, tool these days. Um, and we thought it was really important to show basically, you know, this or, or have a dialogue about what is art, how is it defined, um, who can be an artist. And I think this tool really um, speaks to that. So it, it, we're very interested in seeing how um, things like this will impact the art world. Um, how art is going to be defined based on tools that are basically allowing for this um, basically incredible creative process that didn't exist before. And, and again, is it art? And these are the questions that we're, we're trying to, to, uh, to deal with. But really for us, it's, it's getting back to what I was talking about earlier, which is there is a history uh, in this field and our job is to continue to showcase both uh, current work and that there are artists that have been doing this for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And I think any, any person getting into this field and who wants to buy work and who wants to understand it needs to just take a look back uh, before they're, they're moving forward. Um, so that's something we're very, we're very keen on and will continue to do. Mike, where, any kind of final thoughts there? Um, yeah, I think there's just a lot of, of technology sort of like mixing in different ways that I think it just feels like a very exciting time to be creating because uh, from the AI sort of like standpoint from all of the like blockchain from just this sort of like technology, uh, you know, around displaying this stuff and now you've got, you know, these Da Vinci or Van Gogh sort of like exhibitions and, and new sort of like ways to display our work. I think there's just a lot of, of exciting things kind of coming together. And, and you know, I, I think with social media and sort of the, the speed at which this stuff can, can sort of, people can get ideas from each other and sort of like, oh, you're doing that. And like, you know, it just, I, I think it's really going to be looked back at as kind of like this like renaissance area, era of, of sort of rapid, rapid kind of like development around this stuff. Awesome. Uh, and Ava, last thoughts. Um, yeah, I was at a conference yesterday of Web3 Games and Autonomous Worlds led by Moving Castles. And I think what feels really exciting is that 
maybe we haven't quite figured out what affordances blockchain gives us, but the biggest one is this kind of incentive structure, which means that there's enough money and resources for really smart people to spend time working in these spaces. And I mean, the stories I've heard about artists finally being able to buy a house or <laughs> pay their rent or whatever, and, and that these experiments don't always lead to, you know, like poverty and burnout. I just feel like there's something exciting there uh, when everything starts coming together, Web3 kind of virtual spatial environments and AI and things like that, yeah. Awesome. Well, I want to say thank you to everybody once again. Uh, Ava Yeager from Serpentine Gallery, Steve Saxon, Bitforms Gallery, and of course, people from South Carolina. <laughs> and thanks thank again to the Digital Art Fair for hosting us. Appreciate it. Uh, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Bye-bye.